Excellent. So I'm really uh, happy to say hello to Hannah. Hello, Han. Hey. Who I've known for a great many years now, who runs the completely fabulous canine arthritis management. And as you can see, she is a um, full on proper vet. And um, yeah, so we've got about 15 minutes. Is that right, Han? Yeah, I've had a bit of a disaster. We had it all laid out. It was perfect. And then we've had a couple of phone calls. We've got a chocolate poisoning dog throwing up in one room. We've got a dog with liver disease visiting its folks in another room. So, yeah, I've got 15 minutes, but that's cool. Okay, brilliant. Um, I'm just seeing if I can see any comments coming up. If you can see us, just write a comment so uh, I can make sure I've got my technology work working at this end. And I think this is going out on your canine arthritis uh, we, did uh, link, we? we did do the link. We'll see. We'll see if that works. Great. Um, so, uh, so first of all, yeah, um, look at this. Hannah is finalist for canine, canine arthritis management, your finalist for vet of the year. I can see. I know. I know. No, it's quite cool. And um, it's a good thing for Cam because it's such a, a unique approach to offering vet care for the public. Um, I think people are a little bit suspicious about what we're up to. So mm -hmm. to get this kind of publicity and this kind of acknowledgement and, you know, well done, pat on the back is massive for Fantastic. us. So I'm quite excited. So, so what is CAM all about then? Canine arthritis management? Because in the past it was kind of your dog got lame, you went to the vet, they gave you Metacam and you kind of had this great idea that that isn't what it's all about really. There should be more to it. No. No. And the thing is though, it's really logical because it's actually for following human medicine. Mm -hmm. um, we know that we have to be in charge of our own health and it's not about putting ourselves onto a heavy duty medication plan. It's about making sure we're the right weight, that we've got the right lifestyle. We're looking after ourselves. And we know from human medicine, there's a massive trend to actually being more proactive in that sense. And this is just really following someone else's lead. Um, mm. Cam came about because I just started seeing something I couldn't keep quiet about. And it was mm. the fact that we were seeing so many dogs brought to us way too late, way too late. And it wasn't anybody's fault. You know, the owners didn't know, they didn't understand. The vets only saw that dog maybe once or twice a year. Mm -hmm. And these dogs were presenting off their back legs with no muscle mass, no ability to stand. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't happen overnight. That happens over months, if not years. And it was just and kind of a bit of an epiphany moment of, oh, this is going to change. Mm -hmm. And we can change this. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's what it's about. Ah, excellent stuff. So what kind of stuff are you, are you looking to do? What's the, you know, in, in terms of the alt alternate management of, of uh, arthritis, I suppose, in dogs? Okay, so the ultimate goal is that we actually reduce the incidence of arthritis. So mm. something that we're just beginning to discuss is people's management of their dogs from the moment they think about buying one. Mm -hmm. So actually raising awareness about how the, there are these dysplasias, these problems within breeds, these inherited disorders that do leave them open to arthritis. And that's something that happens quite a lot, is that people talk about these genetic conditions, hip dysplasia, elbow dysplasia, but they don't seem to then go, that means early onset arthritis, and arthritis means pain, and pain can mean a premature death. Mm -hmm. So first of all, that would be an amazing achievement to actually get people to connect these inherited diseases with long-term discomfort, so therefore think before you purchase. And right. when you do purchase, do some background on it. You know, check whether they've been hip scored, elbow scored, look at the breed you're purchasing. Mm. But also think about their weight when they're young. Think about the activities you ask them to do. Mm. So the ultimate goal for CAM, which will probably take years if not decades, is can we actually reduce the incidence of this disease? Mm -hmm. The short term goal is to help people identify it a lot earlier so that they can put in place management plans that are more sympathetic to both the dog and the owner. So we know that a lot of these dogs with the right weight control, the right, right lifestyle, the home management in place, the nutraceuticals, you're going to get good pain control and mm. you don't need to intervene further. Mm. But unfortunately, the education is not there, so people are picking up on signs way too late. Mm -hmm. So how exciting would that be, that if we can actually start tr changing the way that people look at their dog and they take these small observational changes and go, 
could be a problem. I'm going to go and speak to my vet about it. What can I do? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I can't agree more. You know, the, the vast majority of the cases that we see, it's almost too late. You know, they're, they're already, you know, you know, severely disabled by what is a really painful disease. Yeah, and the thing is, people get used to ageing. They think it's ageing. They think their dog is just slowly getting old in front of them. Mm. But actually, it, it's often pain. Yeah. But something that's really interesting for us and um, for me personally is that my eyes are being opened all the time with running this social media platform. Mm. We have a massive population of owners that have very, very young dogs that have been diagnosed with early onset arthritis at eight months, mm -hmm. you know, two years. And they have to manage this dog's condition 10 years. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. really hard. So when a vet will say restricted exercise, we're not talking restricted exercise for four weeks. We're restricting their exercise for 10 years. I know. And um, what's quite interesting is looking at how these people are conversing with us, with each other, and learning from them of their mm. management strategies, what they do. And I think that's great. You know, it's a two-way street. We're learning from them as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there's far too much to go through in the, you know, 10 minutes or whatever, whatever we've got left at the moment. What would be your sort of key takeaways? If you could tell everybody, you know, in, in a, I suppose, a youngish kind of dog that's not showing many signs, it's just starting with arthritis, what, what are the key things you, you would say people should be looking out for and maybe um, looking at implementing in their day-to-day -day lives? Okay, so I love this. This Everybody that's seen one of our um, owner workshops, they know what this means. And it means that there's four ways that you can look at your dog. So you're looking for behavior change. And mm. generally, the first thing that you will see with a dog that's beginning to deal with chronic pain is a change in behavior. And that can be that they, they're a little bit antisocial, they're a little bit slower, they're less enthused on a walk, they might not jump onto the sofa anymore, they might mm. not get into the car anymore, they might even just hesitate the tape so the first one is behavior change and that's generally the first thing that we see mm -hmm. and then we start to see postural change mm -hmm. so you'll see the dog maybe just stand a little bit different they might arch their back the neck carriage might be a little bit below like us if you've got a painful area you weight shift away and that starts becoming the norm because that's more comfortable mm -hmm. so you'll see a posture change and then down around a new circle you start to see a physical change in that dog so you'll start to see that dog's shape change. And a classic one is the Labradors. When you see them when they're young, they're down beautiful you start bullets. To see they're like slick beasts. Mm -hmm. And then as they get older, they start getting bigger and bigger at the front. And they start developing this big mane. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these dogs are weight shifting forward. And therefore, you're getting the associated structural change. So you'll see a body shape change. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it, you can start to see like coat changes. Mm -hmm. And um, I was really lucky. I met this amazing lady doing this myotherapy course. And she told me about coat changes often signifying underlying problems. And I was like, no, it's not. No, I don't believe you. <laughs> and um, one day I actually managed to, grossly as it is, dissect a dog that had coat changes mm -hmm. and she was right as we were dissecting you're like oh my god so physical change mm -hmm. and then you've got your capability change so you'll see dogs that cannot do acts they cannot get on the sofa they mm -hmm. cannot get in the car so it's quite good it's just a very simple little cycle so behavioral change postural change physical change capability change mm -hmm. if you're seeing that and especially if you can take three of them you need to go and see your vet and have a chat Right, excellent stuff. I um, I've been kind of looking on your website as well. Uh, here, uh, you've got your Facebook page, which has got loads of uh, good stuff on there. But you have a, a whole website turned over to it as well. Um, yeah. The canineArthritis.co.uk, which actually, since the I last know. time I looked, has got tons more stuff on it. I know. I have no life. <laughs> Everybody keeps saying to me, "Oh, I love your page." I'm like. <laughs> there's a lot more <laughs> there's something on there that we're really proud of called the it's my home to tool okay and it, um, so I've got, I've got i've got the website up on on the stream now for people to see so we're, we're at your home page here and i can see the menu home big walk guest blog cam conservat conversations oh the cam conversations are massive they take a lot of work so we have everything on cam conversation from um 
bereavement advice all the way through to LED light therapy, laser therapy, hydrotherapy, wow, yeah. um, non use, non side effects, CBD oil, where are we at with that? There is so much, and it's not just our opinion. We, we seek very, very clever people to yeah. write for us. Yeah, um, yeah. So it, it takes a lot of legwork, a lot of pleading, and a lot of nudging and poking to get people to, you know, contribute. <laughs> it looks like every yeah. week or two there's a new article, and there's some, uh, some yeah. you know, some big yeah, names on there. Well, well, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, excellent. And uh, I see you do talks, and you've got a download, downloads, and resources page as well. The the five by five yes. by five management system. Yeah. So basically. When you look at how to manage arthritis, there's a myriad of ways, there's loads and loads, and there is not a prescriptive plan. It's very tailored to that owner, mm -hmm. so the owner's own physical capabilities, financial capabilities, it's tailored to that dog. How old are they? What breed are they? How mm. bad is it? So there is never a set plan, and getting that across to an owner can be really difficult. So we created the OA booklet, mm -hmm. which is designed like a vaccination card to improve communication between the vet and the clients so that mm. all bases are covered to structure an appropriate management plan for that person and their dog. Mm -hmm. But what we didn't want to do is have people purchase this book or the practices supply this book and they run out of space. Mm -hmm. So you've got an amazing download section there that all the pages of the book, you can actually just print them off and put them in, print mm -hmm. them off. So that book is a life book, yeah. which is quite cool. Yeah. The 5x5x5 five by five by five is a communication tool, mm -hmm. and we use it to try and improve communication between client and owner, but mm -hmm. also between vet to vet. So we're in a, a, an era where, unfortunately, you might not see the same vet on a regular basis, but you want that continuity of care. So mm -hmm. that's why we developed that. Yeah. Um, the It's My Home 2 tool is a brilliant tool that um, a lovely team member called Mel Bruder, who is a veterinary physio and an occupational therapist and a human physio, mm. she looked at what tools were available for humans to mm. make the environment more safe, and we've adapted it. So that's quite a bit of work there too. Okay. But we plan to just keep adding. We're just adding. We've got an exercise tool on the way. We've got a lifestyle tool. Um, by the end of this week, of the owner workshop, which is four hours of lectures, will be live online. So you can go to our shop and get four hours wow. of lectures aimed at the owner. Yeah. Excellent stuff. That's fantastic. I mean, it's a, it's a huge resource, isn't it? So, and and there's a forum on here as well. I, I notice. Yeah, we've got forums, because people have different ways of communicating. So we've got Holly's Army, which is one of the groups of our Facebook page. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got about 1,500 owners. And the, the, the idea behind Holly's Army is that you can ask anything. Mm -hmm. And you can also just pop on for support. You can just pop on to say you're having a good day. Because this is a, quite an emotionally debilitating disease for the owner. So Holly's Army is beautiful. I love it, because the people are just fantastic. And what we're finding is we educate that cohort, and when new people arrive, they <coughs> educate the next cohort. So we're creating a, like a pyramid learning, which is fab. But we've also got canine equipment review page, which is where we talk about harnesses, trolleys, beds, bowls, because these are quite expensive, and people have the ability to create financial toxicity, which means you just spend all of your money and you might have not actually spent it appropriately. So we try and help people make purchase decisions. But we also have a forum because some people want a little bit more privacy. They don't mm. want to be in the hoo-ha of social media. So the forum's a little bit more, it's a little bit more dry. Mm. But again, you can ask anything and we have people overseeing it, trying to give advice as well as you being taught from peer to peer, mm. if that makes sense. I see that there's something on there about Arthromid at the moment. Oh, I know. It's now called Aquamid. Uh, Aquamid, yeah, because Arthromid went off license. Oh, we couldn't get it anymore. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Um, so we, we've had our 15 minutes here, Hannah. Can we keep you for a, a little bit longer? or? Sure, do you... I haven't had anybody knock on the door yet. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So, what else do you want to know? Uh, well, excellent. one of the things I, I keep talking to people about having had all the sort of lectures off you guys is modifying exercise around the house and one of the things that you were talking about was micro traumas you know dogs slipping around and struggling on on kitchen floors and on or, you know you know tiles any anything like that what what are the sort of um, environmental changes that people can easily make within the house yeah i would say um 
I know this, and I know it sounds silly. There's not actually much work out there for people to relate to with dogs with slippery floors. There's more work in the human world because right. of trip hazards, slip hazards, post surgery. But with regards to research papers about the influence of slippery floors, etc., in dogs, it's not there yet. Mm. But it's common sense. It's common mm. sense. And then there's so many cases that I've seen where we've just put environmental adaptions in place and that dog's pain state has dramatically reduced mm -hmm. and their quality of life has gone up. So key things that I always try and encourage people to do, sort out your slippery floors. Mm -hmm. Even if your dog is not falling flat on their face, mm -hmm. you just watch and I bet you they slip, 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 slip. Yeah. And that creates muscular guarding. So if you know you're going to slip, mm -hmm. you tend. Mm -hmm. And when you do then slip, it's way more painful. Yeah. So. These dogs, they're already in a compromised state. Don't make it worse. Mm -hmm. So non-slip floor, yeah. stairs. Yeah. Uh -uh. I put two dogs to sleep because of them falling down the stairs. They're not only arthritic and painful, they're weak. Mm -hmm. And they've lost their sense of balance. Yeah. And yeah. we expect them to carry on doing these things because we think they're four by four. Mm. They're not. Okay. Mm. So I beg people... Get on your hands and knees at the top of the stairs and look down and think, okay, how's this going to pan out for me? Not well. I did that the other day. It's not good. It's not good, <laughs> it's not, is it? <laughs> in fact, it was a small child who was telling me to do it. And I, yeah, I mean, it, it, that is steep when you do that. Yeah. And if I can't exactly. imagine if you had elbow arthritis or something and trying to support your weight going yeah. down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you normally find owners will say to you they have trouble getting up the stairs, but it's absolutely fine getting down. That's gravity. <laughs> That's not enthusiasm. Okay. Right. They're just kind so, of collapsing down the stairs. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, so okay. stairs, but they're not just the main stairs of the house. Think about your back door steps. And mm. I see this a lot, and I've seen it a lot over the winter, where people allow their dog the privacy to go out to the loo on their own. Mm -hmm. It might be a bit dark. It might be a bit slippery. They don't see that those four concrete steps are a hazard because they're not stairs mm. they are just as bad mm. so you need to imagine yourself with a debilitating condition and walk around your house and go what would be logical mm. i often say to men imagine yourself wearing a pair of high heels how would you get around this house and they mm. normally look at me going <laughs> but it's really true you have to look at how can I make this environment safer? Because if I want to have them live as long as possible in the most comfortable fashion, mm -hmm. these things add up to big injury. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You're, you're, I think your uh, audio is just cut out there, and I can't, I can't hear you at the moment. <laughs> uh, let's see if we can get you back. Uh, give me a moment. Mm, no, nothing coming through here. No. Can you make signs? <laughs> um, let me see. Let's uh, let's try ha calling you back. I'll try calling you back and let's see if that works for you. You're Come back on. Back. Yeah, I can hear you again now. Excellent okay. stuff. Cool. Yeah. So uh, stairs. Anything else around the house that we need, really need to look at? I think bedding's a really interesting one. So we assumed that all dogs would choose comfort. Mm. Um, the majority do. So think about your bedding. Um, I've seen all man manner of things. Um, those plastic bowl beds, you know, the old-fashioned ones, mm -hmm. massive trip hazards. They come in the side, they catch their toes or their back leg, and they slip and wrench themselves forward. Mm -hmm. So we say make sure it's easy accessible. Mm -hmm. Think about the phone. You know, if you've got... A surface that's really unpredictable and it sinks down unpredictably mm. that's going to make it hard yeah. so make sure it's a non firm phone it's easy to get into it's mm. in an accessible part of the house yeah. backrests a lot of dogs push their backs into into these backrests mm. make sure it's warm it's not in a drafty area and something that is so logical when I say it people go oh yeah Make sure that the floor that they come out of their bed onto isn't slippery because if they've been laying there for two, four, six hours, mm. they're going to be stiff mm -hmm. and they're going to struggle. So by then putting them on an ice rink, we're not giving them any help at all. So bedding would be another one. Raise the food bowls. Mm. There is a small link between dogs that are prone to bloat mm. 
potentially increasing the chances by having a raised platform. So what we suggest is water high, yes. Mm -hmm. But if you've got a large breed dog that might be prone to bloat, mm -hmm. then feed them very small quantities, scatter feed them, use slow feeding devices, something along the line. But mm -hmm. if you've got painful elbow arthritis, if you've got it in your wrist, if you've got compensation into the muscles of your neck, Leaning forward and trying to do a handstand every time you want to drink is not going to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, so I'm just going to ask, I see there's quite a few people out there watching at the moment. I've, I've found, finally sorted out my life when it comes to, to the comments. I can see the comments. So if you've got any questions, pop them in the comments. Uh, but I've got a question for you now. Um, yeah. Exercise. I'm always asked, you know, what can I do to, to alter exercise? And, you know, yeah. I will say stop the ball chucker, you know, long, slow exercise. What, 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 are your, what, what are you finding works well? Okay, so that's one of the reasons we're coming up with an exercise tool. A bit like the It's My Home Too tool, we're trying to give away that people can make their decisions about what is appropriate exercise. But point blank is stop the ball throw. Okay, that high adrenaline mm -hmm. is just not suitable. So when they see these balls that they love, <laughs> all the brain chemicals go crazy and they stop feeling pain. Mm -hmm. So they'll chase that ball, they'll chase that ball, they'll chase the ball, and then eventually they'll either drop or they'll be exhausted. They'll come home, all those neurochemicals go, and they're like, oh, my God, I shouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. So... You always say to me, but he loves the ball. I'm like, no, he's obsessed with the ball. That's different. Mm -hmm. You know, he's obsessed with the ball. What we can do is change the activity. You can ask them to wait, put the ball somewhere, go mm -hmm. and retrieve it. You can go and hide it in the undergrowth. Mm -hmm. You can still have a relationship involving a ball, sure. but we don't want the high momentum. Um, we do lots of scenting games, lots of scatter feeding, that sort of thing. What I try and get people to do is look at what their dog is telling them so if mm -hmm. you've got a dog that five to ten minutes into the walk is already dragging behind you can hear the toes scuffing you can see they get a little bit wobbly then we need to really cut back you know mm -hmm. if you've got a dog that you do a 20 minute walk and they just sleep for the rest of the day and they're really stiff when they get up that's still too much for them and we mm -hmm. need to look at their pain state and things that we can reduce their discomfort and then we can build it up again. Mm. So there isn't a set rule, but I personally find it quite exciting because there's so much we can do. It's like you're less debilitated dogs. Let's change the environment so that they're doing a bit of hill work, a bit of terrain work, and that mm. will improve their sense of balance and their muscle strength. Mm. So exercise is actually a pretty huge topic yeah. um, and very hard to advise that. So when our specs in our little 10 minute consult go little and often, yeah. That's really, that's not, not there yet. So we're going to help you out and make a tool. Excellent. Uh, there's a question here, uh, German Shepherd, obviously for, you know, the dog that is prone to uh, problems, uh, hip dysplasia, elbow dysplasia, two years old, is running with me really a sensible idea? Well, it depends on the dog. So German Shepherd, massive breed variation. Mm. And it depends how well constructed they are. Let's be honest about it. We see a lot of German Shepherds that are born with hip dysplasia and potentially that exercise might not be ideal, whereas something like swimming and gentle hill walking could be. It really does depend on the dog. So mm. what I would do personally is get your vet to have a look at the dog, check their conformation, check their joint function, oh. look at their muscle mass. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Look at their muscle mass. If they're well balanced, if they've got a good muscle mass distribution, they've got nice joint function, then do what the dog is comfortable doing. Mm. Watch them after the exercise. If they cope with it, they're not stiff, they get up, they stretch, they're like, yeah, let's do it again. It's fine. Mm. Although saying that, if you saw me first thing in the morning staggering around the bedroom, you'd think I should never go running again. Anyway, um, next one, do, do supplements like green lip muscle yep. extract help? And I'm going to throw in glucosamine, chondroitin, U-move, uh, all those sort of things. And if so, what age should we start giving them? Okay, so this is a massive topic and it's one of those ones that you're never going to please everyone with what you're going to say. So mm. here goes. So far, omega-3 fatty acids have a lot of evidence behind them that they actually can affect the inflammatory cascade. So mm. omega-3 fatty acids from a marine-based source, so we're looking at ETA, EPA, and DHA. 
which are found in greenlit muscle. But also in greenlit muscle, you can get your glucosamine and your chondroitin sulfate. So mm. greenlit muscle ACE. But the problem is that all of these supplements out there, there's no regulation. Okay, guys? So no one is checking whether A, what they say is in the packet is in the packet, mm. and there is no one checking that they work. Mm -hmm. It's a completely different regulatory body. It's the food agency, not the VMD. So what we suggest is try and stick to a veterinary-based one that has got a good uh, respect level. They do clinical trials. They try and be proactive with their research, okay? Mm -hmm. With things like... Are you going to name names for us here now? Are you going to name, name, name names for us at this point? <laughs> no, no, I can't. I can't do it because we try and stay independent. Um, I think by just saying green lip muscle, I think I've already done a massive push in the right direction. <laughs> but we try and stay independent and not advise a specific brand. Okay. Um, glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate, believe it or not, the jury is still out. Um, there's a lot of the academics that are just saying there are some papers that suggest they work, but then there'll be another paper that completely contradicts it. Mm. So the feeling is, yes, it's safe to use, and if you're going to use it, use it younger than later. Mm. Um, turmeric, massive debate going on here. At present, not much evidence that it does what it says it's going to do. Mm. But there are people out there that say it's blinding. So mm. what we say with turmeric is by all means use it, but beware, it can cause stomach irritation. Mm -hmm. It actually potentially works on the same pathway that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Mm -hmm. If you had a dog that was on turmeric and then you started Metacam, Metacam will get the blame. Mm -hmm. But it could have been turmeric that irritated the gut. Mm -hmm. So it can affect gallbladder contractions, stomach lining, etc. Yes, use it, but be sensible with it. If you don't think it's working, it probably isn't. Don't mm -hmm. worry about it. Um, Boswellia, there's another one. Limited studies. Some people say it works really well, but there is limited evidence of effect. Cod liver oil? Mm -hmm. cod, li cod liver oil? No, gone. Yeah, so cod liver's out. Even though it's marine derived, it's not got the right. Even though it's marine derived, it hasn't got a high enough concentration of the omega three fatty acids. And pretty bad for the eyes as well. Too much vitamin A. Yeah, vitamin A toxicosis for cats as well. So mm, got to no. be a bit careful with it. Excellent. Yeah. Um, the other thing we've started using uh, recently is more and more things like par paracetamol, mantadine. I mean, we don't have to just focus in on, you know, metacams or lots comes this world anymore. There's, yeah. there's a whole arsenal of sort of drugs out there that, which it's are better. It's really, it's really exciting, but um, we've got an amazing lady that works on a team called Gwen, who works for Bristol University, and she is a European diploma holder. Fantastic. You met her. She's lovely. Yeah, she's lovely. Um, and she's very honest. You know, there's still a lack of evidence. Um, with regard to using these drugs. So the only way that we can use them is making sure that we've got a really brilliant client-vet relationship so that we can tailor these drugs mm. to effect. Mm. So for example, putting a dog onto gabapentin, you're going to put on a low dose and you're going to titrate up. Mm -hmm. It could take four weeks to get to a clinical effect. Mm. The only way that's going to work is if you two can talk and you can be objective. But mm. it's exciting. There's a lot more options out there. And it's not just a broad brush, one drug's going to fix it. It seems to me yes. that some drugs work better in some dogs than others. And you, you've yes, got to play absolutely. around a little bit with, with, with the, the overall sort of combination that you use with them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's what multimodal means. It means that you use different things to achieve the ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. And by using lots of different things, you don't use anything in such a high concentration that you could get the side effects that come with it. Mm -hmm. And the most simplest thing is weight control, lifestyle change, yeah. modifying your house, yeah. no side effects and free. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, we've got another question here. Is hydrotherapy good for arthritis or does the water counteract the non-impact exercise? So hydrotherapy is brilliant. Um, it's brilliant for pain relief. It's brilliant for muscle building. It's, it's a good modality, but it's got to be in the right hands. Mm -hmm. And it's also dog dependent. So there's no point in forcing a dog that's in petrified with water to do something like that because mm -hmm. you're not going to get the best response. They're going to tense up. They're not going to use their muscles and their body appropriately. You've also got to make sure that you're with a qualified person. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've seen people have hydrotherapy and it can actually do more harm than good. Mm -hmm. So yes, hydrotherapy really has its place with a qualified person at a qualified pool and somebody that is being... Oh, you've gone again. Oh, you, your audio's gone again. I know... 
hang on, we'll do the callback thing. Obviously Facebook's saying, that's enough. Let's see if this works. Back again. Game. I probably have Back on. Okay, no, no, no problems. So we were up to, yeah, so hydrotherapy. I always remember years ago, I, <laughs> we had a partner with a dog that we operated on and I said hydrotherapy and uh, a couple of weeks later I um, I found him in the river in his waders yeah. with his dog you know 20 yards downstream on a, on a clothesline swimming upstream yeah. so you know that cold water you know just swimming around in streams is there any benefit to just kind of going out you know with a dog that doesn't necessarily have a problem but you just want to keep him fit you know do, will no, it I reduce the risk yeah. um, i think a really inspirational lady for me was one where her um, german shepherd was diagnosed with such severe hip dysplasia she was told it gets two years mm -hmm. and i saw her at seven years and i was like wow your mm -hmm. dog's got good glutes what's going on and she was like well i rain or shine we go for a wade in the river so she bought a wetsuit and every day, part of their exercise, they would wade through this um, this stream that wasn't too high intensity. The, the surface was predictable, but they just waded. And this dog was insane. Mm -hmm. So with things like hip dysplasia, muscle um, strength around those joints can really slow the progression of the disease. So mm -hmm. therapy amazing. I mean... I've got to say thank you so much for coming on, Han. I, I realise you've got to get back to your your patients now. I really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, there you go. nice. Uh, and you know this this topic is huge. We've not even touched on things like stem cell therapy, PRP, lasers, surgical treatment, so joint joint again. replacement. Yeah, we should. We should. You know, if there's enough people that say yes on there, we'll, we'll do it again at some point. Yeah, but, yeah, and get a list of questions, and we'll just have a proper yarn. Okay, that'd be brilliant. Well, thanks ever so much for that, Han. That's all right. It's nice talking to you. And I better go back to work. Yeah, good luck with your vomiting dog. I hope it's okay. Chocolate? Chocolate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See you then. See you later. Take care. Bye. Bye.